The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 28 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the um, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, it's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. Just to sort of uh, recap, um, we've we've discovered that um, uh, Arthur is uh, living in a parallel, or because, yeah, well, we all know that he's living in a parallel universe because the Earth is back. Uh, but because of the fact that both he and Fenchurch came from a uh, plural zone, traveling or jumping through. Um, uh, space is not sensible interstellar travel can prove difficult and on one such journey um, Fenchurch disappeared and so Arthur went off to try and find some meaning about this and ended up going to a very odd planet uh, with uh, trying to seek some enlightenment and Ford has been doing some investigations around the guide because uh, he knows something weird is going on. Uh, and we don't know what's happening with the Grebulons at the moment, but we do know that Trisha McMillan, a.k.a. Uh, Trillian, in another reality, is off on the planet Rupert, uh, helping them sort out their uh, astrological... Yeah. Astronomy is the real one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Of course it is. Astronomy is the real one. Astrology is the pretend one. Apologies to people that believe in astrology. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. If it works for you, great. The world needs people just to be happy. So, there we go. So, uh, let's crack on. Oh, of course, I hope you are sitting comfortably. Hi, Mum. Hello. Hello, Mother. Good to see you. Um, uh, I am going to drink my tea, as we do always at the beginning, um, and wish you all a very pleasant Sunday. I hope you had great weekends. Uh, thanks for sticking with me, and thanks for the supportive messages. Um, and, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's crack on. So, tea. Right. Oh, God. I say it every time. <laughs> I love tea. I'm so English. <clears throat> anyway, here we go. Chapter 10 of Mostly Harmless. 
Ford hurled himself at the door of the editor-in-chief's office, tucked himself into a tight ball as the frame splintered and gave way once again. He rolled rapidly across the floor to where the smart grey crushed leather sofa was and set up his strategic operational base behind it. That at least was the plan. Unfortunately, the smart grey crushed leather sofa wasn't there. Why, thought Ford, as he twisted himself round in mid-air, lurched, dived and scuttled for cover behind Harl's desk, did people have this stupid obsession with rearranging their office furniture every five minutes? Why, for instance, replace a perfectly serviceable, if rather muted, grey crushed leather sofa with what appeared to be a small tank? And who was the big guy? with the mobile rocket launcher on his shoulder. Someone from head office? Couldn't be. This was head office. At least it was the head office of the guide. Where these Infinidim Enterprises guys came from, Zarkwon knew. Nowhere very sunny, judging from the slug-like colour and texture of their skins. This was all wrong, thought Ford. People connected with the guide should come from sunny places. There were several of them, in fact, and all of them seemed to be more heavily armed and armoured than you'd normally expect corporate executives to be, even in today's rough-and-tumble business world. He was making a lot of assumptions here, of course. He was assuming that the big, bull-necked, slug-like guys were in some way connected with Infinidim Enterprises. But it was a reasonable assumption, and he felt happy about it because they had logos on their armour plating, which said Infinidim Enterprises. He had a nagging suspicion that this was not a business meeting, though. He also had a nagging feeling that these slug-like creatures were familiar to him in some way. Familiar, but in unfamiliar guise. Well, he had been in the room for a good two and a half seconds now, and thought it was probably about time to start doing something constructive. He could take a hostage. That would be good. Van Hal was in his swivel chair, looking alarmed, pale and shaken. He probably had some bad news as well as a nasty bang to the back of his head. Ford leapt to his feet and made a running grab for him. Under the pretext of getting him into a good, solid, double underpinned and elbow lock, Ford managed surreptitiously to slip the identities back into Harl's inner pocket. Bingo! He'd done what he came to do. Now he just had to talk his way out of there. OK, he said. I... He paused. The big guy with the rocket launcher was turning towards Ford Prefect and pointing it at him, which Ford couldn't help feeling was wildly irresponsible behaviour. I... He started again, and then, on a sudden impulse, decided to duck. There was a deafening roar as flames leapt from the back of the rocket launcher and a rocket leapt from its front. The rocket hurtled past Ford and hit the large plate glass window, which billowed outwards in a shower of a million shards under the force of the explosion. Huge shock waves of noise and air pressure reverberated around the room, sweeping a couple of chairs, a filing cabinet, and Colin, the security robot, out of the window. Ah, so they're not totally rocket proof after all, thought Ford Prefect to himself. Someone should have a word with somebody about that. He disentangled himself from Harl and tried to work out which way to run. He was surrounded. The big guy with the rocket launcher was moving it up into position for another shot. Ford was completely at a loss for what to do next. Look! he said in a stern voice, but he wasn't certain how far saying things like look in a stern voice was necessarily going to get him, and time was not on his side. What the hell, he thought, you're only young once, and threw himself out of the window. That would at least keep the element of surprise on his side. The first thing 
Arthur Dent had to do, he realised resignedly, was to get himself a life. This meant he had to find a planet he could have one on. It had to be a planet he could breathe on, where he could stand up and sit down without experiencing gravitational discomfort. It had to be somewhere in where the acid levels were low and the plants generally didn't actually attack you. I hate to be anthropic about this, he said to the strange thing behind the desk at the Resettlement Advice Centre on Pintleton Alpha, but I'd quite like to live somewhere where the people look vaguely like me as well. You know, sort of human. The strange thing behind the desk waved some of its stranger bits around and seemed rather taken aback by this. It oozed and glopped off its seat, thrashed its way slowly across the floor, ingested the old metal filing cabinet, and then, with a great belch, excreted the appropriate drawer. It popped out a couple of glistening tentacles from its ear, removed some of the drawer, and stuck the drawer back in and vomited up the cabinet again. It thrashed its way back across the floor, slimed its way back up onto the seat, and slapped the files on the table. "'See anything you fancy?' it asked. Arthur looked nervously through some of the grubby and damp pieces of paper. He was definitely in some backwater part of the galaxy here, and somewhere off to the left as far as the universe he knew and recognised sorry, and somewhere off to the left as far as the universe he knew and recognised was concerned. In the space where his own home should have been, there was a rotten hick planet, drowned with rain and inhabited by thugs and bog hogs. Even the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy seemed to work only fitfully here, which was why he was reduced to making these sorts of inquiries in these sorts of places. One place he always asked after was Stavromula Beta, but no one had ever heard of such a planet. The available worlds looked pretty grim. They had little to offer him because he had little to offer them. He had been extremely chastened to realise that although he originally came from a world which had cars and computers and ballet and armagnac, he didn't, by himself, know how any of it worked. He couldn't do it. Left to his own devices, he couldn't build a toaster. He could just about make a sandwich, and that was it. There was not a lot of demand for his services. Arthur's heart sank. This surprised him because he thought it was already about as low as it could possibly be. He closed his eyes for a moment. He so much wanted to be home. He so much wanted his own home world, the actual earth he had grown up on, not to have been demolished. He so much wanted none of this to have happened. He so much wanted that when he opened his eyes again he would be standing on the doorstep of his little cottage in the west country of England, that the sun would be shining over the green hills, the post van would be going up the lane, the daffodils would be blooming in his garden, and in the distance the pub would be opening for lunch. He wanted so much to take the newspaper down to the pub and read it over a pint of bitter, don't we all right now? (laughs) He so much wanted to do the crossword. He so much wanted to be able to get completely stuck on 17 across. He opened his eyes. The strange thing was pulsating irritably at him tapping some kind of pseudopod on the desk. Arthur shook his head and looked at the next sheet of paper. Grim, he thought. And the next. Very grim. And the next. Oh, now, that looked better. It was a world called Bartledan. 
It had oxygen. It had green hills. It even, it seemed, had a renowned literary culture. But the thing that most aroused his interest was a photograph of a small bunch of Bartledanian people standing around in a village square, smiling pleasantly at the camera. Ah, he said, and held the picture up to the strange thing behind the desk. Its arm eyes squirmed out on stalks and rolled up and down the piece of paper, leaving a glistening trail of slime all over it. Yes, it said with distaste. They do look exactly like you. Oh, hello, Karen. Sorry, I'm just going to take a quick pause. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me? Uh, it seems to be streaming OK. But Karen Scott has just said, is there anybody there? Can, can you give me a quick wave? Send me a little post, a little message to say that it's working. Are you hearing this, everyone? Is it happening? Is it working? Or do we have a technical foobar? Ah, OK, thanks, Niels. You can hear it, OK? Groovy. I will crack on. I will crack on. OK, great. Thanks a lot, James. I appreciate that. I'll crack on. Right. Sorry, it's just that uh, Karen Scott said that she had a problem. Right, here we go. We'll carry on. Arthur moved. How weird. Try, uh, OK, um... Can someone write to Karen? I can't really write at the moment. Perhaps that if she tries restarting the stream, she might get she might get back to us. Technical foolbarth. Um if someone could write that to Karen, that would be great. I really appreciate that. I don't have the ability to do that. Anyway, I will carry on. Alright. Right, so Arthur moved to Bartle Dam. And, using some money he had made by selling some toenail clippings and a spit to a DNA bank, he bought himself a room in the village featured in the picket picture. It was pleasant there. The air was balmy. The people looked like him and seemed not to mind him being there. They didn't attack him with anything. He bought some clothes and a cupboard to put them in. He had now got himself a life. Now he had to find purpose in it. At first he tried to sit and read, but the literature of Bartledan, famed though it was throughout the sector of the galaxy for its subtlety and grace, didn't seem to be able to sustain his interest. The problem was that it wasn't actually about human beings after all. It wasn't about what human beings wanted. The people of Bartledan were remarkably like human beings to look at, but when you said good evening to one, he would tend to look around with a slight sense of surprise, sniff the air, and say that, yes, he supposed that it probably was a goodish evening now that Arthur had come to mention it. No, wh what I meant was to wish you a good evening, Arthur would say, or rather used to say. He soon learned to avoid these conversations. I mean that I hope you have a good evening, he would add. More puzzlement. Wish? The Bartledanian would say at last, in polite bafflement. Uh, y yes, Arthur would then have said, in slight uh, um, confusion. I I I'm, I'm just expressing the hope that... Hope? Yes. What? What is hope? Good question, thought Arthur to himself, and retreated back to his room to think about things. On the one hand, he could only recognise and respect what he learned about the Bartledanian view of the universe, which was that the universe was what the universe was, take it or leave it. On the other hand, he could not help but feel that not to desire anything, not ever to wish or to hope, was just not natural natural. There was a tricky word. He had long ago realised that a lot of things that he had thought of as natural, like buying people presents at Christmas, 
stopping at red lights, or falling at a rate of 32 feet per second per second, were just the habits of his own world, and didn't necessarily work the same way anywhere else. But not to wish. That really couldn't be natural, could it? That would be like not breathing. Breathing was another thing that the Bartledanians didn't do. Despite all the oxygen in the atmosphere, they just stood there. Occasionally, they ran around and played netball and stuff. Without ever wishing to win, though, of course, they would just play, and whoever won, won. But they never actually breathed. It was, for some reason, unnecessary. Arthur quickly learned that playing netball with them was just too spooky. Though they looked like humans and even moved and sounded like humans, they didn't breathe and they didn't wish for things. Breathing and wishing for things, on the other hand, was just about all that Arthur seemed to do all day. Sometimes he would wish for things so much that his breathing would get quite agitated and he would have to go and lie down for a bit, on his own, in his small room, so far from the world which had given birth to him that his brain could not even process the sort of numbers involved without just going limp. He preferred not to think about it. He preferred just to sit and read, or at least he would prefer it if there was anything worth reading. But nobody in Bartledanian stories ever wanted anything. Not even a glass of water. Certainly, they would fetch one if they were thirsty. But if there wasn't one available, they would think no more about it. He had just read an entire book in which the main character had, over the course of a week, done some work in his garden, played a great deal of netball, helped mend a road, fathered a child on his wife, and then unexpectedly died of thirst just before the last chapter. In exasperation, Arthur had combed his way back through the book and in the end found a passing reference to some problem with the plumbing in chapter two. And that was it. So, the guy dies. It just happens. It wasn't even the climax of the book because there wasn't one. The character died about a third of the way through the penultimate chapter of the book, and the rest of it was just stuff about road mending. The book just finished dead at the 100,000th word, because that was how long books were on Bart Bartledan. Arthur threw the book across the room, sold the room, and left. He started to travel with wild abandon, trading in more and more spit, toenails, fingernails, blood, hair, anything that anybody wanted, for tickets. For seamen, he discovered that he could travel first class. He settled nowhere, but only existed in the hermetic twilight world of the cabins of hyperspatial starships, eating, drinking, sleeping, watching movies only stopping at spaceports long enough to donate more DNA and catch the next long-haul ship out. He waited and waited for another accident to happen. The trouble with trying to make the right accident work is that it won't. That is not what accident means the accident that eventually occurred was not what he had planned at all. The ship he was on blipped in hyperspace, flickered horribly between 97 different points in the galaxy simultaneously, caught the unexpected gravitational pull of an uncharted planet in one of them, became ensnared in its outer atmosphere, and began to fall, screaming and tearing into it. The ship's systems protested all the way down that everything was perfectly normal and under control. But then, when it went into a final hectic spin, 
It ripped wildly through half a mile of trees and finally exploded into a seething ball of flame. It became clear that this was not the case. Fire engulfed the forest, boiled into the night, then neatly put itself out, as all unscheduled fires over a certain size are now required to do by law. For a short while afterwards, other small fires flared up here and there as odd pieces of scattered debris exploded quietly in their own time. Then they too died away. Arthur Dent, because of the sheer boredom of endless interstellar flight, was the only one on board who had actually familiarised himself with the ship's safety procedures in case of an unscheduled landing, and therefore was the sole survivor. He lay dazed, broken and bleeding, in a sort of fluffy pink plastic cocoon with Have a Nice Day, printed in over 3,000 different languages all over it. Black, roaring silences swam sickeningly through his shattered mind. He knew, with a kind of resigned certainty, that he would survive because he had not yet been to Stavromula Beta. After what seemed an eternity of pain and darkness, he became aware of quiet shapes moving around him. Slurp of tea. Ford tumbled through the open air in a cloud of glass splinters and chair parts. Again, he hadn't really thought things through. Really, and was just playing it by ear, buying time. At times of major crisis, he found he was quite often... It, sorry, I'm going to start that entire chapter again and put my teeth in this time. Ford... <laughs> Sorry. Ford tumbled through the open air in a cloud of glass splinters and chair parts. Again, he hadn't really thought things through, and was just playing it by ear, buying time. At times of major crisis, he found it was quite often helpful to have his life flash before his eyes. It gave him a chance to reflect on things, to see things in some sort of perspective, and it sometimes furnished him with a vital clue as what to do next. There was the ground rushing up to meet him at 30 feet per second per second, but he would, he thought, deal with that problem when he got to it. First things first. Ah, here it came, his childhood. Humdrum stuff, yeah, yeah. He'd been through it all before. Images flashed by, boring times on Beetlejuice 5, Zaphod Beeblebrox as a kid, yeah, 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 he knew all that. He wished he had some kind of fast-forward in his brain. His seventh birthday party, being given his first towel. Come on, come on! He was twisting and turning downwards. The outside air at this height, a cold shock to his lungs, trying not to inhale glass. Early voyages to other planets. Oh, for Zark's sake, this was like some sort of bloody travelogue documentary before the main feature. First beginning to work for the... Ah, those were the days. They worked out of a hut on the... Oh, my God, excuse me. They worked out of a hut on the Buenelli Atoll on Fenala before the Rictarnacols and the Danaqueds vertled it. Half a dozen guys, some towels, a handful of highly sophisticated digital devices and, most importantly, a lot of dreams. No, most importantly, a lot of Fenalian rum. To be completely accurate, that old jank spirit was the absolute most important thing, then the Fenalian rum, and also some of the beaches on the atoll where the local girls would hang out, but the dreams were important as well. Whatever happened to those? He couldn't quite remember what the dreams were, in fact, but they had seemed immensely important at the time. They had certainly not involved this huge, towering office block he was now falling down the side of. 
All of that had come when some of the original team had started to settle down and get greedy, while he and others had stayed out in the field researching and hitchhiking, and gradually becoming more and more isolated from the corporate nightmare the guide had inexorably turned into, and the architectural monstrosity it had come to occupy. Where were the dreams in that? He thought of all the corporate lawyers who occupied half of the building, all the operatives who occupied the lower levels, and all the sub-editors and their secretaries and their secretaries' lawyers and their secretaries' lawyers' secretaries, and worst of all, the accountants and the marketing department. He had half a mind just to keep on falling, two fingers to the lot of them. He was just passing the seventh floor now, where the marketing department hung out, load of tosspots all arguing about what colour the guide should be and exercising their infinitely infallible skills of being wise after the event. If any of them had chosen to look out the window at that moment, they would have been startled by the sight of Ford Prefect dropping past them to his certain death and flicking V-signs at them. I love that. Sixteenth floor. Sub-editors. Bastards. What about all that copy they'd cut? Fifteen years of research he'd filed from one planet alone, and they'd cut it to two words, mostly harmless. V-signs to them as well. Fifteenth floor. Logistical administration. Whatever that was about. They all had big cars. That, he thought, was what that was all about. Fourteenth floor personnel. He had a very shrewd suspicion that it was they who had engineered his fifteen-year exile while the guide metamorphosed into the corporate monolith, or rather duolith, mustn't forget the lawyers, it had become. Thirteenth floor. Research and development. Hang about. Thirteenth floor. He was having to think rather fast at the moment because the situation was becoming a little urgent. He suddenly remembered the floor display panel on the elevator. He hadn't had a thirteenth floor. He thought no more about it because having spent fifteen years on the rather backward planet Earth where they were superstitious about the number thirteen, he was used to being in buildings that numbered their floors without it. No reason for that here, though. The windows of the thirteenth floor, he could not help noticing as he flashed swiftly by them, were darkened. What was going on in there? He started to remember all the stuff that Harl had been talking about. One new multi-dimensional guide spread out across an infinite number of universes. It had sounded, the way Harl had put it, like wild, meaningless, dreamed-up, that wild meaninglessness dreamed up by the marketing department with the backing of the accountants. If it was any more real than that, then it was a very weird and dangerous idea. Was it real? What was going on behind the darkened windows of the sealed-off thirteenth floor? Ford felt a rising sense of curiosity, and then a rising sense of panic. That was the complete list of rising feelings he had. In every other respect, he was falling very rapidly. He really ought to turn his mind to wondering how he was going to get out of this situation alive. He glanced down. A hundred feet or so below him, people were milling around, some of them beginning to look up expectantly, clearing a space for him, even temporarily calling off the wonderful and completely fatuous hunt for wockets. He would hate to disappoint them, but about two feet below him, he hadn't realised before, was Colin. Colin had obviously been happily dancing attendance and waiting for him to decide what he wanted to do. Colin! Ford bawled. Colin didn't respond. Ford went cold. Then he suddenly realised that he hadn't told Colin his name was Colin. Come up here! Ford bawled. Colin bobbed up beside him. Colin was enjoying the ride down immensely, and hoped that Ford was too. Colin's word, world, went unexpectedly dark, as Ford's towel suddenly enveloped him. Colin immediately felt himself get much, much heavier. 
He was thrilled and delighted by the challenge that Ford had present him with. Just not sure if he could handle it, that was all. The towel was slung over Colin. Ford was hanging from the towel, gripping its seams. Other hitchhikers had seemed fit to modify their towels in exotic ways, weaving all kinds of esoteric tools and utilities and even computer equipment into their fabric. Ford, however, was a purist. He liked to keep things simple. He carried a regular towel from a regular domestic soft furnishings shop. It even had a kind of blue and pink floral pattern, despite his repeated attempts to bleach and stonewash it. It had a couple of pieces of wire threaded into it, a bit of flexible writing stick, and also some nutrients soaked into one of the corners of the fabric so he could suck on it on a, in an emergency. But otherwise, it was a simple towel you could dry your face on. The only actual modification he had been persuaded by a friend to make was to reinforce the seams. Ford gripped the seams like a maniac. They were still descending, but the rate had slowed. Up, Colin, up! he shouted. Nothing. Your name, shouted Ford, is Colin, so when I shout up, Colin, I want you, Colin, to go up, OK? Up, Colin! Nothing, or rather a sort of muffled groaning sound from Colin. Ford was very anxious. They were descending very slowly now, but Ford was very anxious about the sort of people he could see assembling on the ground beneath him. Friendly local wocket hunting types were dispersing, and thick, heavy, bull-necked, slug-like creatures with rocket launchers were, it seemed, sliding out of what was actually called thin air. Thin air, as all experienced galactic travellers well know, is in fact extremely thick, with multi-dimensional complexities. Up! bellowed Ford again. Up! Colin, go up! Colin was straining and groaning. They were now more or less stationary in the air. Ford felt as if his fingers were breaking. Up! They stayed put. Up! Up! A slug was preparing to launch a rocket at him. Ford couldn't believe it. He was hanging from a towel in mid-air, and a slug was preparing to fire rockets at him. He was running out of anything he could think of, do, think of doing, and was beginning to get seriously alarmed. This was the sort of predicament that he usually relied on having the guide available for to give advice, however infuriating or glib, but this was not a moment for reaching into his pocket. And the guide seemed no longer a friend, an ally, but now was itself a source of danger. These were the guide offices he was hanging outside for Zark's sake, in danger of his life from the people who now appeared to own the thing. What had become of all the dreams he vaguely remembered having on the Buenelli Alt Atoll? They should let it all be. They should have stayed there, stayed on the beach, loved good women, lived on fish. He should have known it was all going wrong the moment they started hanging around, hanging grand pianos over the sea monster pool in the atrium. He began to feel thoroughly wasted and miserable. His fingers were on fire with clenched pain, and his ankle was still hurting. Oh, thank you, ankle, he thought to himself bitterly. Thank you for bringing up your problems at this time. I expect you'd have a nice warm foot bath to make you better, wouldn't you? Or at least you'd like me to. He had an idea. The armoured slug had hoisted the rocket launcher up onto his shoulder. The rocket was presumably designed to hit anything in its path that moved. Ford tried not to sweat because he could feel his grip on the seams of his towel slipping. With the toe of his good foot he nudged and prized at the heel of the shoe on his hurting foot. Go up, damn you, Ford muttered hopelessly to Colin, who was cheerily straining away but unable to rise. Ford worked away at the heel of his shoe. He was trying to judge the timing, but there was no point just go for it. He only had one shot, and that was it. He had now eased the back of his shoe down off his heel. His twisted ankle felt a bit better. Well, that was good, wasn't it? 
With his other foot, he kicked at the heel of the shoe. It slipped off his foot and fell through the air. About half a second later, a rocket erupted up from the muzzle of its launcher, encountered the shoe falling through its path, went straight for it, hit it, and exploded with a great sense of satisfaction and achievement. This all happened about fifteen feet from the ground. The main force of the explosion was directed downwards, where a second earlier there had been a squad of Infinidium Enterprises executives with rocket launchers standing on an elegant terraced plaza paved with large slabs of lustrous stone cut from the ancient alabastrum quarries of Zental Quabula. There was now, instead, a big pit with nasty bits in it. A great womp of hot air welled up from the explosion, throwing Ford and Colin violently up into the sky. Ford fought desperately and blindly to hold on, and failed. He turned helplessly upwards through the sky, reached the peak of a parabola, paused, and then started to fall again. He fell, and fell, and fell, and suddenly winded himself badly on Colin, who was still rising. He clasped himself desperately onto the small spherical robot. Colin slewed widely through, wildly through the air towards the tower of the guide offices, trying delightedly to control himself and slow down. The world spun sickeningly round Ford's head as they spun and twisted round each other, and then, equally sickeningly, everything suddenly stopped. Ford found himself deposited dizzily on a window ledge. His towel fell past and he grabbed at it and caught it. Colin bobbed in the air inches away from him. Ford looked around himself in a bruised, bleeding and breathless daze. The ledge was only about a foot wide, and he was perched precariously on it. Thirteen stories up. Thirteen. He knew they were thirteen stories up because the windows were dark. He was bitterly upset. He had bought these shoes for some absurd price in a store on the Lower East Side in New York. He had, as a result, written an entire essay on the joys of great footwear, all of which had been jettisoned in the mostly harmless debacle. Damn everything. And now one of the shoes was gone. He threw his head back and stared at the sky. It wouldn't be such a grim tragedy if the planet in question hadn't been demolished, which meant that he wouldn't even be able to get another pair. Yes, given the infinite sideways extension of probability, there was, of course, an almost infinite multiplicity of planets on of planet Earth, but when you came down to it, a major pair of shoes wasn't something you could just replace by mucking about in multidimensional space-time. He sighed. Oh, well, he better make the best of it. At least it had saved his life, for the time being. He was perched on a foot-wide ledge, thirteen storeys up the side of a building, and he wasn't at all sure that that was worth a good shoe. He stared in woozily through the darkened glass. It was as dark and silent as the tomb. No, that was a ridiculous thing to think. He'd been to some great parties in a tomb. Could he, de de could he detect some movement? He wasn't quite sure. It seemed that he could see some kind of weird, flapping shadow. Perhaps it was just blood dribbling over his eyelashes. He wiped it away. Boy, he'd love to have a farm somewhere, keep some sheep. He peered into the window again, trying to make out what the shape was, but he had the feeling, so common in today's universe, that he was looking into some kind of optical illusion, and that his eyes were just playing silly buggers with him. Was there, was there a bird of some kind in there? Was that what they'd hidden away up here on, on a concealed floor behind darkened rocket-proof glass? Someone's aviary? 
There was certainly something flapping about in there, but it seemed not not so much like a bird, more a kind of bird-shaped hole in space. He closed his eyes, which he'd been wanting to do for a bit anyway. He wondered what the hell to do next. Jump? Climb? He didn't think there was going to be any way of breaking in. OK, the supposedly rocket-proof glass hadn't stood up when it came to it, to an actual rocket. But then that had been a rocket that had been fired at a very short range from inside, which probably wasn't what the engineers who designed it had had in mind. It didn't mean he was going to be able to break the window here by wrapping his fist in his towel and punching. What the hell? He tried anyway, and hurt his fist. It was just while he couldn't get a good swing from where he was sitting, or he might have hurt it quite badly. The building had been sturdily reinforced when it was completely rebuilt after the Frogstar attack, and was probably the most heavily armoured publishing company in the business, but there was always, he thought, some weakness in any system designed by a corporate committee. He'd already found one of them. The engineers who designed the windows had not expected them to be hit by a rocket from the short range on the inside, so the window had failed. So, what would the engineers not be expecting someone sitting on the ledge outside the window to do? He racked his brains for a moment before he got it. The thing they wouldn't be expecting him to do was to be there in the first place. Only an absolute idiot would be sitting where he was, so he was winning already. A common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. He pulled his newly acquired credit card from his pocket, slid it into a crack where the window met its surrounding frame, and did something a rocket would not have been able to do. He wiggled it around a bit. He felt a catch slip. He slid the window open and almost fell backwards off the ledge laughing, giving thanks as he did so for the great ventilation and telephone riots of SRDT 3454. The great ventilation and telephone riots of SRDT 3454 had started off as just a lot of hot air. Hot air was, of course, the problem that ventilation was supposed to solve, and generally it had solved the problem reasonably well, up to the point when someone invented air conditioning, which solved the problem far more throbbingly. And that was all well and good, provided you could stand the noise and the dribbling until someone else came up with something even sexier and smarter than air conditioning, which was called in-building climate control. Now this was quite something. Major differences from just ordinary air conditioning were that it was thrilling, thrillingly more expensive and involved a huge amount of sophisticated measuring and regulating equipment, which it was far better at knowing, moment by moment, what kind of air people wanted to breathe than mere people did. It also meant that to be sure that mere people didn't muck up the sophisticated calculations which the system was making on their behalf, all the windows in the buildings were sealed shut. This is true. While the systems were being installed, a number of people who were going to work in the buildings found themselves having conversations with Breatho Smart Systems Fitters, which went something like this. But what if we want to have the windows open? You won't want to have the windows open with new Breatho Smart. Yes, but supposing we just wanted to have them open for a little bit. You don't want to have them open even for a little bit. The new Breatho Smart system will see to that. Hmm. Enjoy Breatho Smart. OK, so what if the Breatho Smart breaks down or goes wrong or something? Ah, one of the smartest features of the Breatho Smart is that it cannot possibly go wrong. So, no worries on that score. Enjoy your breathing now and have a nice day.
It was, of course, a result, as a result of the great ventilation and telephone riots of SRDT3454, that all mechanical or electrical, quantum mechanical or hydraulic or even wind, steam or piston-driven devices are now required to have a certain legend emblazoned on them somewhere. It doesn't matter how small the object is, the designers of the object have got to find a way of squeezing the legend in somewhere, because it is their attention which is being drawn to it, rather than necessarily that of the users. The legend is this. The major difference between a thing that might go wrong and a thing that cannot possibly go wrong is that when a thing that cannot possibly go wrong goes wrong, it usually turns out to be impossible to get at or repair. Major heat waves started to coincide with almost magical precision with major failures of the Breatho Smart systems. To begin with, this merely caused simmering resentment, and only a few deaths from asphyxiation. The real horror erupted on the day that three events happened simultaneously. The first event was that Breatho Smart Incorporated issued a statement to the effect that the best results were achieved by using their system systems in temperate climates. The second event was the breakdown of a Breatho Smart system on a particularly hot and humid day, with the result of a resulting evacuation of many hundreds of office staff into the street, where they met the third event, which was a rampaging mob of long-distance telephone operators who had got so twisted with having to say all day and every day, thank you for using BSNS to every single idiot who picked up a phone, that they'd finally taken to the streets with trash cans, megaphones and rifles. In the ensuing days of carnage, every single window in the city, rocket-proof or not, was smashed, usually to accompanying cries of, get off the line, asshole, I don't care what number you want, what extension you're calling from, go stick a firework up your bottom, yee-haw, hoo-hoo-hoo, volume, squawk, and a variety of other animal noises that they didn't get a chance to practice in the normal line of their work. As a result of this, all telephone operators were granted a constitutional right to say, use B, S and S and die, at least once an hour when answering the phone, and all office buildings were required to have windows that opened, if only a little bit. Another unexpected result was a dramatic lowering of the suicide rate. All sorts of stressed and rising executives who had been forced during the dark days of the Breatho Smart tyranny to jump in front of trains or stab themselves could now just clamber out onto their own window ledges and leap off at their leisure. What frequently happened, though, was that in the moment or two they had to look around and gather their thoughts, they would suddenly discover that all that they had really needed was a breath of fresh air and a fresh perspective on things and maybe also a farm on which they could keep a few sheep. Another completely unlooked-for result was that Ford Prefect, stranded 13 storeys up a heavily armoured building, armed with nothing but a towel and credit card, was nevertheless able to clamber through a supposedly rocket-proof window to safety. He closed the window neatly after him. The windows... the, the thing he hadn't realised about the window... sorry... He closed the window neatly after him, having first allowed Colin to follow him through, and then started to look around for this bird thing. The thing he realised about the windows was this. Because they had been converted into openable windows after they had been first designed to be impregnable, they were, in fact, much less secure than if they had been designed as openable windows in the first place. Hey-ho, it's a funny old life, he was just thinking to himself, when he suddenly realised that the room he had gone into, uh, he'd gone to all this trouble to break into, was not a very interesting one. He stopped in surprise. Where was the strange flapping shape? Where was anything that was worth all this palaver, the extraordinary veil of secrecy that seemed to lie over this room, and the equally extraordinary sequence events that seemed to conspire to get him into it? The room, like every other room in this building now, was done out in some appallingly tasteful grey. There were a few charts and drawings on the wall. 
most of them were meaningless to Ford. But then he came across something that was obviously a mock-up for a poster of some kind. There was a kind of bird-like logo on it, and a slogan that said, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Mark II. The single most astounding thing of any kind, ever, coming to a dimension near you. No more information than that. Ford looked around again. Then his attention was gradually drawn to Colin, the absurdly over-happy security robot who was cowering in a corner of the room, gibbering with what seemed strangely like fear. Odd, thought Ford. He looked around to see what it was that Colin might have been reacting to. Then he saw something that he hadn't noticed before, lying quietly on top of a workbench. It was circular and black, and about the size of a small side plate. Its top and its bottom were smoothly convex, so that it resembled a small, lightweight throwing discus. The surfaces seemed to be completely smooth, unbroken, and featureless. It was doing nothing. Then Ford noticed that there was something written on it. Strange. There hadn't been anything written on it a moment ago, and now suddenly there was. There just didn't seem to have been any observable transition between the two states. All it said, in small, alarming letters, was a single word. Panic. A moment ago, there hadn't been any marks or cracks on its surface. Now there were. They were growing. Panic, the guide Mark II said. Ford began to do as he was told. He had just remembered why the slug-like creatures looked familiar. Their colour scheme was a kind of corporate grey. But, in all other respects, they looked exactly like Vogons. Oh my god, that's an exciting moment! And that's where we're going to leave it! <gasps> oh my word, the Vogons are in control of the guide. What the heck is going on? Belgium, man, Belgium. Right, yes, let's leave it there for this week. Thank you so much for coming along, everybody. I will make an appeal. I didn't do it at the beginning of the show, but if you could, it's all here. But, do, 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 become a patron and support the Bearded Weird on Patreon.com. If you could go to patreon.com forward slash the Bearded Wit and sign up to become a patron um, from $5 a month, uh, I would really, 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 really appreciate that. That's fantastic. Um, there is some good stuff coming up um, uh, for, with, with uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that a bit later. Let's not get into that now. But let's just say for this evening, thank you so much for coming along, for listening in, for joining in. Uh, we'll crack on with the story again even further next week. Uh, look after yourselves. Um, fingers crossed that everything is going to be okay for you in your little corner of the world. Become a patron. <laughs> oh, also, could you do me a huge favour? I have also started up uh, putting this, uh, slightly edited versions of this, onto a YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and look for The Bearded Wit on YouTube and follow and subscribe on that one, that would be great too. Because I'm trying to get this out into as many channels as possible. But I would really, really appreciate that. So go to, the, go to Patreon, become a patron. Yes, love you. And go to YouTube and follow and subscribe. And of course, share this stuff. If you really enjoy this and you think your friends and family or whatever would enjoy this, please do share that too. I'll stop dinging my little controller here. Have a lovely week. See you next Sunday. Take care of yourselves. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, which gives you a huge amount of scope. Thank you very much, guys. See you soon. Bye.